Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jesse Lee. I'm the online programs director here at the White House. Uh, we've got a really special event here today. I'm, I'm really happy to have everybody here. We're going to try something new for the first time. It's called an Open for Questions Roundtable, where uh, we've invited some uh, reporters from the online world, uh, representing some very different kind of angles on the immigration debate. And uh, as you probably know, the president gave a major speech today on the need for comprehensive immigration reform. So we really wanted to take questions from all kinds of different angles of the debate and uh, from you, the American public, too. So if you're on Facebook watching this, drop your questions uh, into the chat here. Um, I'm here with Samil uh, Cecilia Munoz, who's our director of in intergovernmental affairs here. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with her. She's very passionate, um, insanely smart. Um, and uh, Cecilia, uh, what, do you want to say a few words and then I'll introduce the rest of the folks here? Sure. Thanks a lot, Jesse, and thanks to all of you for, for being here to do this. This is very exciting. The president gave a speech this morning at American University where he called for comprehensive immigration reform and really laid out the case that on this contentious, difficult issue, if there's a consensus on any one thing, it's that we have a broken system and it needs to be fixed. Uh, and he needs help in Congress in order to get that job done. So he really called on Congress to step forward. There are 11 Republicans in the Senate who have voted for an immigration reform in the past, and he made it clear he needs some of them to come forward now uh, so that we can get this job done for the American people. All right, and uh, who we have joining us is uh, we have Maggie Reardon. Uh, she's a senior writer at uh, CNET. Uh, we've got Brian Wingfield from uh, Forbes, and we've got uh, Jay Keller, who's with examiner.com, and um, I think we'll go ahead and just get us started with uh, the examiner.com. You can, you can tell us a little bit about your outlet and uh, kind of who you're representing here a little bit, and uh, yeah, go ahead and kick it off. You had the longest ride here, I know. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, Examiner.com is in 240 markets in the U.S. and Canada, and we have our writers, which are examiners, covering a multitude of topics. Um, we tapped into um, their abilities and their audiences and asked questions, um, solicited questions for people to ask um, Ms. Munoz today. Um, but an examiner basically has brought forth the questions, what I'm here to do is represent more of the reader's output than anything else. Okay. You, you want to go ahead and uh, ask your first sure. question and kick it off? Um, one popular question that we got uh, from Arizona, actually, was about the DREAM Act. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you would you know, explain a little bit more about the DREAM Act and, and see what the status is. Sure. This is something the President uh, mentioned today in his speech. Um, the DREAM Act is a law that's been proposed now for many years that um, particularly focuses on young people who were brought to this country by their parents, often as infants, so they've grown up here. But they're, they're here illegally. Often they don't even find out that they don't have immigration status until they try to go to college or get a job. Uh, this is their country. They don't, they've, they've never lived anyplace else that they can remember. They didn't choose to come here illegally. And the DREAM Act uh, provides them with legal status and allows them to go to college and to be able to move forward. This is something the president has supported since he was uh, in the U.S. Senate, in fact, since he was in the Illinois State Senate. Um, and he made a strong case for it today. It's a part of the comprehensive work that we need to do on immigration reform, and it's a very important policy initiative. Thank you. Okay, and uh, one thing I should also note is uh, we're going to have a uh, representative from Univision here, too. He's caught up in a little bit of traffic coming from the uh, president's speech, which anybody who's been to D.C. knows, uh, knows the traffic. Um, but let's go ahead and move on to uh, Forbes. Sure. I'm Brian Wingfield with Forbes, and uh, I'm here to talk about uh, issues that our readers and, and the business community is, are, are uh, interested in. Uh, Forbes.com is the homepage for the world's business leaders, so we, uh, if you're interested in business, please go to Forbes.com. Um, so I guess I, I want to ask, um, one thing that the president said uh, today was that businesses will be held accountable for, knowing, uh, for knowingly hiring uh, illegal immigrants. And this is something that is of importance to our readers. Um, employers often say that even if they, to the, to the best of their abilities, hire people um, that they think are legal, uh, they still open themselves up to lawsuits, to class action suits, um, uh, alleging that they're hiring illegal workers. And there's no safe harbor provision right now. Is this something that the administration could support? Well, so the president really talked about 
two different kinds of employers uh, today in his address. So one is he talked about the employers who are, who are clearly bad actors, who are knowingly recruiting, smuggling, hiring, and underpaying undocumented immigrants because they, it's a way it provides them, they think, with a competitive advantage. Um, and those folks, we have the capacity to go after now under the law, and we're being pretty vigorous about doing that. But that's not most of the employer community. Most of the employer community is trying to abide by the law. Uh, this is part of the, the reason what you described is really an example of the ways in which our immigration law is broken, and that you can be following the rules, doing everything right, and still end up with undocumented employees, and your business could be in jeopardy if there's a, a, an immigration action. You could lose part of your workforce. That kind of thing happens as a result of immigration enforcement a lot. So the other thing the president said was that we are implementing and continually improving a verification system to, that helps employers be able to uh, reliably verify the people that they hire. Um, and this is something that we have to do more on. Employers need a fast, efficient, inexpensive way to make sure that the people that they hire are legally here. And, and we need to make sure that that, way is, that that method is reliable for employers and also for people in the workforce so that if, they're, if you're legally in the United States, you can be verified quickly. So that's part of the agenda for a comprehensive immigration reform because we recognize that right now this is a cumbersome process that isn't working for employers. All right. Um, and sorry to cut you off, but I, I wanted to take one from the uh, Facebook chat here. There's uh, a lot of people flooding in, trying to keep up. Uh, this is kind of, uh, you know, maybe the most common question we get, probably. Uh, it's from Kevin Stewart. It's just, why won't President Obama simply enforce the U.S. immigration laws that he swore to uphold and defend? There's the easy answer to that is that the president is enforcing the immigration laws that he swore to uphold and defend. We, he said today in his speech, we have more boots on the ground at the border than at any time in our country's history. Uh, uh, apprehensions of immigrants are going down. Crime in immigrant community in, in border communities is either leveling off or going down. Uh, we're doing a, a, a very effective job in interdicting drugs and guns and, and, and money, not just moving from south to north, but from north to south. So we're doing a very vigorous job of enforcing the law. But the issue is that enforcement by itself isn't going to solve this problem. Um, that, that if enforcement alone were to solve the problem, the fact that we've, we've increased resources for enforcement so much would suggest that we wouldn't have a problem, but everybody acknowledges that we do. That's why you need to fix the law. Ultimately, if we're going to get to a solution and make sure that immigrants come to this country perfectly legally, you can't just enforce the law. You also have to fix the law. And for that, we need the Congress. All right. Um, and one thing I'll say is if you go to whitehouse.gov, uh, kind of our main feature right now is on the President's speech today. And if you click through the links there, you'll find some good resources on the President's record on uh, enforcement at the border and everything. Um, so let's go to Maggie Reardon with CNET. Hi. Um, CNET is a, a technology website, and so our readers are most interested in gadgets and gizmos and also just general tech news. So coming from that perspective, um, I want to talk a little bit about legal immigrants and specifically folks who are on uh, visas. And I know about a decade ago during the tech boom, a lot of companies were um, you know, crying that there was a shortage of H-1B visas. Um, I know with the recession that it took uh, you know, up until December to hit the cap for H-1B visas. So my question to you is, is there still a shortage? And um, you know, I know that there has been talk of the fact that we don't have enough math and science uh, graduates coming out of our educational system. But, uh, you know, is that still an issue? I know it was an issue, you know, a decade ago, but have we done anything to sort of close that gap? Well, the President actually made, made this case as well. I mean, I'm not sure you can argue right now that there's a big shortage of, uh, of high-tech workers or, or for the H-1B pool. The number of requests for those workers has been going down. But at the same time, I think that the tech industry really um, kind of lives this challenge every day in that we have a really cumbersome system that makes it hard to hire some of the best and brightest that are even coming out of U.S. universities. We attract all this talent from all over the world uh, to really our first class university system. And the president said it really eloquently today. We end up creating such a cumbersome process for those folks to end up in jobs in the United States that have the effect of creating more jobs and really stimulating the economy, what we end up doing is training our competition because we train all these talented students and then we make it impossible for them to stay and use their talents here in this country and have the impact of creating jobs. That doesn't make sense. That's why the legal immigration system needs to be fixed. That's why we're taking a comprehensive, a comprehensive approach to this problem. 
Okay, uh, one, one of the questions we had in the chat was very much on that topic, and uh, it was from Martin Vega arguing that uh, it, it, this vision and talking about the best and brightest uh, not being welcome here is at odds because it, it, he says uh, most of the nations in 11 million plus undocumented are primarily from Mexico and Central America. He seems to believe that that's not the source of those kinds of uh, jobs. Do you have any response to that? Yeah, so the undocumented population really comes in two ways. There's uh, folks um, who cross the border illegally and often on foot, and then a, a somewhat larger group who are folks who come on perfectly valid visas from all, all over the world, on tourist visas, visitors visas, student visas, and then they overstay those visas, and at that point they, uh, they become uh, illegally present in the United States. And they're, so uh, we have undocumented immigrants from everywhere in the world. Uh, and they're in all kinds of sectors of the, of the labor market. So we, there are, there's a strong presence in agricultural and in the service sector. That's absolutely true. And these are industries which tell us that they rely on this labor. If you eat fruits and vegetables in this country, you're benefiting from the hard work of undocumented immigrants. And we also have uh, immigration issues. Uh, on, on the high, in the high tech sector and in the higher skilled segments of, of the economy. So this is why we have to take a comprehensive approach. We have to fix what's broken about our immigration system um, to make sure that the people who come, come legally and that we do an effective job of bringing the people that we want, that we believe are in our economic interest that can help our economy grow and build a strong, sustainable economy for the future. All right. Um. And uh, if, for those of you who might have heard the door creaking, we were just joined by uh, F Fernando Pizarro, uh, the Washington affiliate correspondent for uh, Univision and uh, representing Univision.com. And uh, thanks for coming. Um, sure. So actually, my, why don't I just kick it to you? We've just been having people introduce themselves, talk a little bit about kind of their, their outlet's angle on this debate. And uh, you know, go ahead and take your first question if you got one. Well, Cecilia knows us for a long time, you know, Univision has been covering the immigration debate for a really long time, and uh, on this opportunity, we, we ask questions from, uh, from readers, and uh, I was told, like, I don't know if you want to answer in Spanish as well, um, I'm going to say it in English. Um, one of the questions, Alberto asks that every time that the media publishes a story about the failure of reform, the administration comes out and says, no, that's not true, and says that there will be reform. But they feel that those are just words and little action. What's the concrete action this time to avoid that it fails? I've, thank you. I've, I've heard this argument a lot, that people in the community are frustrated because the president has said really since the campaign that he's for a comprehensive reform and people are wondering why we haven't been able to deliver it yet. And the answer to that is that we need the United States Congress in order to be able to deliver an immigration reform. If this were just a question of presidential will, we would be done with this debate already. It would, if it would have happened. So um, uh, we need votes in the House of Representatives and in the Senate. This is why the president has been trying so hard to work in a bipartisan way. Because we know we need votes from Democrats. The president said today we have the majority of the Democrats ready to move forward. We have the president ready to move forward. And right now, of the 11 Republicans who supported immigration reform four years ago, we don't have anybody saying right now that they'd be prepared to move a bill forward. So um, in order to reform immigration, we need cooperation in the Congress. And what the president did today was make a forceful case that we have to do it now, that he is prepared to do everything that he can do to make it happen, but he needs partners in Congress to get this over the finish line. Si le puedo responder en español. Or, sí, just briefly in Spanish. In español, el presidente ha dicho que está a favor de una reforma del sistema de inmigración, pero él solo no puede uh, alcanzar esta meta. Necesita cooperación en el Congreso. Necesitamos algunos votos de los republicanos que hace cuatro años votaron a favor de una reforma. No necesitamos todos los 11 republicanos, pero necesitamos algunos. Así que sin el apoyo de, en el Congreso, el presidente solo no puede uh, ter, uh, realizar esta meta. Necesitamos acción en el Congreso para tener una reforma del sistema de inmigración. All right, and uh, just so you know, we'll be capturing this, uh, the video of this entire event in Spanish as well afterwards. Uh, we'll hope to get that up uh, tomorrow morning, soon after that, if not. Um, to cut in from one more question from the chat, and this is actually more of a comment, but uh, it, it touched on some of the themes that the president was talking about today. Uh, Enrique Patron says, you know, there are many people that have no status uh, 
but they open businesses and give jobs to Americans. And as you can imagine, that's coming out of a, a rather vibrant debate that's going on in the chat. But maybe you can touch a little bit on what the president was saying along those lines today. Yeah, so among, for example, uh, publicly traded companies um, that were started by with venture capital, about a quarter of those are started by immigrants, and those have the impact of creating jobs. Um, uh, there's a, a, all kinds of conversation among economists, but generally the agreement is that Im immigrants who come in, including those who work in the low-skilled sector, have the effect of creating at least one job and often more for others in the economy. Um, so we, there's, it's in our economic interest to make sure that we get this policy right, and that means making sure that the people who come, come legally, so that uh, businesses can't be uh, uh, paying them a different set of wages than they pay other workers. Um, and, and because we're a nation of laws, the president made a very forceful case today. It is reasonable and, in fact, important that we enforce our immigration laws and that we impose a regime that requires that people be here legally. But we need help from Congress in order to get there, and that's why he's made such a forceful case today. All right. And uh, let, let's go for round two with uh, Jay Keller again. Um, <clears throat> thank you. One, one of the topics that comes up a lot is about the idea of earned legalization. Mm -hmm. um, so would any new legislation sponsored by President Obama include a provision for earned legalization for individuals who have you know, entered the US illegally but have worked, paid taxes, and are of good moral character um, you know, to become legal residents after a certain number of years or, or something like that? So the president today made a case that there's kind of three options. Uh, one is to try to round up 11 million people and chase them out of the country, which is impractical and unlikely to happen and, and ferociously expensive and disruptive. The other is to sort of grant a blanket amnesty to everybody, uh, which he believes flies in the face of being a nation of laws. And the third, which is really what we're proposing, is to hold people accountable that, who are here illegally. Uh, require them to come forward, admit that they've broken the law, and take steps to get on the right side of the law by paying taxes, by learning English, by paying a fine. Um, it, this, this is really all about holding people accountable and making sure that we are not just holding the immigrants accountable and requiring the, them to come forward or be exposed to enforcement, but also holding businesses accountable and holding the federal government also accountable for making sure that we enforce the law as effectively as possible. Okay, and uh, we've, we've got a bit of a graffiti artist in the chat asking uh, over and over again, why not the DREAM Act as a standalone bill? So the DREAM Act, which I described before, is terribly important. The president absolutely supports it. And if Congress, if, if our allies in Congress decide to move forward on the DREAM Act, we will, be, we will happily support it. The president has been a supporter really for much of his career. Um, so that's, if it moves forward, that progress is progress. It has the same 60 vote threshold as anything else that moves in the United States Senate, and that's the challenge. We, in order to pass the DREAM Act or a comprehensive reform or anything else, we're going to need to get to 60 votes, and some of those votes are going to have to be from Republicans. And so in order to accomplish any piece of this debate, we're going to need that support. All right. Um, and let's go back to Brian with Forbes. Sure. Uh, so, so one of the things the President also talked about, he was very clear on, in fact, was the position of amnesty and, and said he did not want to, to, to do that. Um, but this is something in, in our uh, articles on, on immigration that has generated quite a bit of, of commentary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in fact, one reader said, why, why, we have a legal way to enter the country, why don't we follow the law, why do we let illegal immigrants stay in our country? Um, we just did a, a, a package on immigration and, and the, probably the article that generated, or among the articles that generated the most comment was, was one that said this. Our immigration policy should reorient itself toward professionals and highly skilled tradesmen following the lead of Australia, Ireland, and Canada. We must close off the flow of unskilled illegal aliens by enforcing the law, by not at sub subverting it with amnesty, and mandatory work eligibility checks by employers. What, what, are, you, what are your thoughts on that statement? Well, we already have mandatory work eligibility checks by employers. Um, I think one of the, the difficulties in the system that the President referred to today is that uh, folks bypass that, um, some, sometimes immigrants bypass that by using forged documents, and sometimes employers find ways to bypa bypass that. So this, that's clearly an area where we have to do more, and we need legislation in order to be able to do that more effectively. 
Um, but this larger question is the, the assumption that we only need immigrants on one side of the economy and not the other. We should be choosing, and the, the point of an immigration reform is that we should be choosing who comes, and it, it should be consistent with our economic interests. Um, I think one of the things that people in this country often don't understand is that part of the reason people come illegally is that um, unless you have a close family member or a, uh, a, a, you're a highly skilled worker with an employer petitioning for you, there is no line for you to get in. There is no path to come here illegally, or to come here legally. So people uh, uh, are faced with no choice if they want to come and work in the United States except to cross the border by foot or to come on a visa and overstay. So part of a comprehensive immigration reform means making sure we have lines that work to meet our economic needs. Um, and so this is why it's important to do it in a comprehensive way so that we are choosing who comes, we're doing it based on our economic interest, and we're making sure that everybody who comes, comes with a visa. All right, and uh, let's go back to Maggie Reardon again. Okay, so in the last question I, I asked you, you said that we need to, to keep uh, some of the, the brightest um, folks who are here on student visas and keep them working here. But my question is, if we speed up the process, um, H-1Bs to green cards and so forth, what about security? I mean, for example, the, the guy who is the, the Times Square um, bomber, uh, he, he came on a student visa. He, then he had an H-1B visa. Then he eventually got a green card and um, became a citizen. So how do we, you know, if you're speeding up that process, is there a danger that um, we could be letting in potential terrorists? Well, you can't speed up the process in a way that bypasses the security checks. I mean, the whole part of the rationale for reforming our immigration system is and, and making sure that we know who's here and who's coming is a security rationale. So uh, it's important to make sure that as we make visas available that we uh, continue to do what we're already doing, which is making sure that we do a thorough FBI check and a security check on everybody who comes in on any kind of visa. Um, so that's essential, and, and the president made the case today that there used to be a year-long backlog for FBI checks, and we have eliminated that backlog because it's terribly important to make sure that that is part of, our, of the system of granting visas. So, but those goals shouldn't be incompatible. You should, we should be able to... It just seems to me, I know that the, the process for these visas has gotten longer, actually. In fact, people are waiting, you know, previously people waited maybe five to seven years for a green card. Now they're waiting, you know, 10 or more years. So, you know, so, so what happens in terms of, like, making sure uh, that you're doing those checks if we're already backlogged a decade? The decade-long backlog is not about security checks. It's about the number of visas which are available. And this is one of the things which makes our system dangerous, is that if people know that when you apply for a visa, it's going to take 10 years before your number comes up, some of those people choose to bypass the system and come illegally, and then we never have a chance to do a security check. So you need to make enough visas available to meet the need and to, fa and to facilitate doing the background check. So the backlogs themselves, uh, end up creating so many obstacles that people bypass the system and come illegally. So in order to meet our security objectives, we need a law that works. We need a system that functions. And then we need to make sure that we do the security checks expeditiously before anybody gets a visa. All right. And uh, let's take Fernando a second. Um, Cecilia, many people have talked that, let, let's say that there isn't success at this time with, uh, you know, with congressional approval. Many people have... Um, speculated about maybe executive action and you know via an executive decision whether it's deportations whether it's even the dream act is there any chance of that happening or any type of executive action taking place soon well I think there are multiple kinds of executive action I think people and the president addressed this today in his speech he's heard from advocates who make a passionate moral case that we should stop enforcing the law and stop uh, doing immigration enforcement against the immigrants who were here illegally. And his view is that he swore an oath and, uh, to uphold the Constitution and to enforce our laws, and he, he in, intends to make good on that oath, and in fact is making good on that oath, and that we are vigorously enforcing the law. But he has also said and, uh, that how we do it matters. And Secretary Napolitano, the, who, who runs the Department of Homeland Security, has been involved in a, in a consistent review of our enforcement policies to make sure that we're making the best choices from a law enforcement perspective to make sure that we enforce the law effectively and well. 
What that means is that she's prioritized and asked her agency to prioritize the people who, who are the most dangerous. So that if we have the resources to remove roughly 400,000 people from the country every year, which is about the resources that Congress give us, we want to use those resources especially to go after people who are violent criminals, who pose some kind of danger or some kind of threat, so that the proportion of people removed from the country should, the, the proportion of dangerous criminals who are removed from the country should increase while the proportion of regular folks decreases because we want to use our enforcement resources as effectively as possible. So, so that's what the agency is doing. That, those are administrative changes that we have already begun to make and there are uh, more, we will continue to review those policies and make adjustments. But those adjustments are going to be from a law enforcement perspective because we take our responsibility to enforce the law so seriously. Okay. Um, and that, that sounded sound a little complicated to digest into a two-sentence Spanish answer, so... If she, if she can, I'd be more than happy. <laughs> it's up to you. you, you well, you're going to caption it in Spanish yeah, so well, people will have a chance. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, let, let's take, take one from the chat here. Uh, Dottie Lewis uh, Classit, it sounds like, sorry if I'm getting your name wrong there, uh, just asks, uh, what can we do to keep families together? Well, this is a terribly important issue, and it also came up in the speech. Um, there are two challenges with respect to families. One is that the legal immigration system, which we've talked about a little bit, is so backlogged that American citizens and legal residents of this country who are trying to reunite even with spouses and their own spouses or their children often have to wait years before a visa is available. And so our, what's broken about our legal immigration system keeps families apart. And that's something that we need to address in a reform. The other challenge, and this goes to Fernando's previous question, is that um, we have 11 million people living in this country illegally. Uh, many of them have been here for a long time and are raising families in this country. And immigration enforcement, in some cases, has the impact of separating families from their parents from their children or spouses from each other. Um, which is a devastating uh, effect on, on families and communities and individuals. We're not going to be able to completely fix that until we fix the immigration system. We are making sure that the manner in which we enforce the law is focused, as I said before, on the folks who are particularly dangerous and less on regular folks who are just trying to make a living. But as long as, we, as this problem remains unaddressed and we have 11 million people living and working in this country, without immigration papers, we're going to face these challenges in families and communities, and it's disruptive. Uh, it's harmful to kids in schools. Uh, this is, you know, our country can do better than that, and that's where we're trying to go. All right. Um, Jay, you got another one up your sleeve? I do, actually. Um, um, a reader from Sacramento, California, um, Elizabeth Fair, asked, uh, pointed out something that I think was very interesting. It goes back to everybody's questions about the business side of things. Um, one concern behind illegal immigration is that many find themselves exploited by the businesses that hire them. Um, and she, she was really concerned and, and wanted to know why isn't the government doing more to target these businesses instead of the workers? Well, the answer to that question is that we are doing more to target the businesses instead of the workers. This is one of the administrative changes in enforcement that I just described. When we say our priority is to go after the greatest harm and the greatest danger, in immigrant communities that means particularly going after folks who are criminals. And in the employer community this means especially going after employers who are violating multiple laws. It's not just that they hired uh, undocumented immigrant workers but that often that they are housing them in, in terrible conditions, that they are paying them some substandard wages or exposing them to dangerous conditions in the workplace. Um, so the, the, in fact, the pattern of enforcement against employers since Secretary Napolitano came on board has been to focus on those, the worst uh, actors uh, because we believe that's the best use of our resources, to go after particularly employers who are smuggling people into this country in order to exploit them. Uh, we believe that's how, where we should be putting the focus on enforcement, and that has, and that's in fact what we're doing. But again, we're never going to completely enforce our way out of this problem. We need a change in the law to make sure that uh, we're better able to hold employers accountable for making sure their workers are here legally. All right, and uh, I took that down as a very similar question from James Hills Ford uh, in the chat, so I hope we covered your bases there. Uh, another question on accountability, which it seems a lot of people picked up on, was kind of a main theme of the president's speech. 
across the board. Uh, Danielle Medina says, if accountability is, what, accountability is what this new policy rests on, how can we ensure that uh, uh, illegal immigrants will actually be accountable and what are the consequences for those who don't come forward and admit they've broken the law? So assuming we pass a law um, and we uh, impose this accountability regimen on the uh, illegal immigrant population, we require them to come forward, pay a fine, learn English, pay their taxes, uh, that's going to shrink the size of the population uh, and we'll be able to better target our enforcement resources. So if you don't come forward and get on the right side of the law, you will be much more vulnerable to immigration enforcement. We'll be able to do a much better job of being effective about it. Um, so it's, it, it's, there's our incentives for people to come forward. Uh, and for the folks who don't want to come forward because they might have a criminal record, for example, those people wouldn't be eligible, we're going to be much better able to direct our enforcement resources at them. Okay. And uh, Brian? Sure. Um, the President has made the case that we do need more highly skilled workers in the United States. We need to keep them here. Um, the flip side uh, that some of our readers have pointed out is that unemployment is now near 10 percent. Right. And that in the U.S. workforce there are probably people who can do some of these high skilled jobs. In fact, one reader writes in who he applied as a job for, or he wanted to apply for a job as a computer programmer in New York, um, but found that it was only available to H-1B visa holders. He says, why are U.S. citizens not being allowed to freely compete for this job in New York City, USA? So I guess the question is, how do you encourage more highly skilled people to be here? At the same time, how do you encourage employment in the United States, particularly when unemployment is so high? So what you just described is a, is a misuse of the H-1B program, and I believe it's an unlawful misuse of the H-1B program. Employers are only supposed to be granted access to these, those are actually non-immigrant visas, uh, if they can demonstrate that they did a search and looked for American workers to fill those jobs and were unable to find them. So the example that you just described is actually an employer who's abusing the system. And that's, again, that's where our enforcement resources should be directed so that we make sure that American workers have first shot at these jobs. But ultimately, in policy terms, it's not a zero-sum game. That it's, we have to be doing both and we should be doing both, making sure that we train our workers, uh, American workers first and foremost, to be on the front lines of building the economy of the future. But immigrant workers who are a much, a tiny proportion of the total workforce, play an important role uh, in sectors of the economy that create jobs as uh, entrepreneurs, as I mentioned before, uh, and in other roles. So, and for the immigrants who come and end up in the workforce, they end up having the impact of creating jobs for everybody else. So in our vibrant, the vibrant growing economy that we are, uh, that are, we're really uh, reestablishing coming out of this recession and leading into the future, there is a place for immig immigrants to be part of the engine that's driving economic growth. Okay. Um, it, it, the President touched on the fact that the law in Arizona has kind of brought this issue back to the fore recently. Uh, Jay's first question, I think, was from Arizona. Uh, so just to take a couple on that, uh, Raquel Brown asked about the sentiment uh, uh, of people who say, support the Arizona law because the feds can't and won't do their jobs. Uh, another question that we got earlier on Facebook, even before this started, was um, the idea that uh, they, uh, Allison had heard that uh, basically all that law does is kind of repeat the federal laws on the book and books and say we shouldn't enforce it, so what's wrong with that? So maybe you could spell that out a little bit. Yeah, the Arizona law doesn't just repeat federal law. I mean, what it does is it empowers local officials to be um, to, in the course of doing their duties, if they suspect someone to be unlawfully present in the United States, it requires them to, to ask those folks for their papers and then to take action. What we've heard from law enforcement officials, and there were a number of them in the audience today uh, uh, with the president, is that they believe that that uh, undermines their ability to effectively enforce the law in their communities. Uh, we've heard from police chiefs who say that every time, if you're required to do that and you do, a, say, a traffic stop, and you ask somebody then for their immigration papers. I'm not sure if anybody around this table actually carries papers in their wallets that prove that they're US citizens. Um, and so processing somebody like that can take hours. And those are hours that that police officer is not going to spend going after a burglar or, or somebody worse than that. And so we have law enforcement officials across the country saying to us, 
don't undermine our ability to establish our own priorities on where we ought to be using our enforcement resources. We want to go after the biggest dangers to the community. If you require us to spend all of our time chasing down immigrants, we're not going to be able to do our jobs effectively or well. So in the end, having a policy in Arizona and another one in a town in Nebraska and another one in towns in other parts of the country isn't going to solve our immigration problem. It's going to create these other kinds of problems, especially for law enforcement. And it takes Congress off the hook. I mean, I think the president shares the frustration of the people who say, at least the Arizona law is something. Uh, what he's saying is that something isn't going to be terribly effective. What, the, what we need is for people in Congress to take action. OK. Um, and uh, Maggie, I think we're back to you. Yep, back to me. So um, you had mentioned uh, in your response, and I know the president has talked about you know, the value of um, entrepreneurs who are immigrants. Um, but as you stated before, there's no legal way for someone to uh, have a work visa in this country unless they're sponsored right. by another company. So, um, and if you've got 25% of venture-backed companies um, being started by uh, immigrants, and I know in, in the tech field there's quite a few uh, large companies, yes. Google being one of them, <laughs> uh, that's generating a lot of, of uh, revenue for, the, you know, for everyone, <laughs> a lot of jobs. So, but how, how are you, I mean, is the president's plan going to um, strike a path for, for entrepreneurs who do not have um, a company that's backing them? Yeah, so there's actually a visa program under the law now for uh, entrepreneurs. I, my understanding is that it's pretty limited. You have to be willing to invest a certain amount in the country and demonstrate that you're able to create a particular number of jobs. Um, and there's, there's, there's a small number of visas available for that under the law now. Um, but again, the whole system needs to be designed with an eye toward what are our economic needs, where are the opportunities for growth and job creation. Um, we need to do right by that sector of the economy and we have to do right by American families. You, people shouldn't have to wait to reunite with their spouses or their own kids. And very often, the people who end up being the entrepreneurs starting those companies and creating those jobs didn't come in because they were entrepreneurs, they came in because they were the family member of somebody here. So um, our family system benefits the country economically just as the... But the is there any kind of specific type of program? Because, for example, um, you know, Hewlett Packard was started in a garage. You know, the, the guys at Google were, you know, they were students at the time. But, you know, I don't think that they were demonstrating uh, that they were going to be generating the kind of revenue that they are now uh, back then. So is there anything to sort of get these really innovative upstarts uh, in the country and, and developing here instead of somewhere else? The way the law works now, you have to have some connection to the United States unless you're able to meet the conditions of this investor visa, which is an investment of, I, I think, I'm, I forget the exact amount, uh, and then demonstration that you're able to create a certain, a specified number of jobs. So those are areas that we need to be looking at. This is the kind of step we're asking Congress to engage with us in so that we can pass a reform that meets our economic needs and helps address what's broken about our immigration system. Okay, um, let's go back to Fernando. I think we might be able to squeeze in one more quick round here. Um, as you know, I was, I was at the speech and getting reactions from some of the pro-immigration reform activists there who attended the speech. And uh, even though many of them were very happy with the speech, uh, quite a few lamented the fact that there was no timeline, no deadline set. And this administration has set a lot of deadlines for a lot of bills already, but there was none here. Why not? And if so, can we expect a deadline further on? They believed otherwise it's going to be kicked all the way to 2011. So I had the pleasure of going with the president when he spoke to the uh, Republican caucus in the U.S. Senate to take the case right to the Republicans, to ask them directly in an informal setting without cameras around for their, for their support, to hear what their concerns were, and to ask them to come on board. And um, one of the things he said was, we'll do this when you're comfortable doing it. So if you're prepared to move it in the summer, I will be with you to move it in the summer. If you need to wait until after, until maybe the fall, when after some of you are past primary season, we'll do it then. He's available and willing to do it at any point in the rest of this legislative year. And so um, the important thing is to keep the pressure on so that folks come forward. If we set an arbitrary deadline and, and we end up getting past that deadline, it gives 
the folks that we're trying to attract to this debate the opportunity to declare the debate dead. And we're, this president is not prepared to declare this debate dead. He will use every opportunity to move a bill forward in this Congress because, as he said, we cannot wait to get an immigration reform done. We have to use every available tool. All right. And uh, one more from Jay Keller. Um, a lot of the feedback that we got was based on the border states around you know, the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, really, a lot of the readers just wanted to know what's first. Um, where does the president move from here? Like, what is, besides going to Congress and trying to solicit help, um, what's the first thing that he's looking to do right away? Well, we're continually um, uh, looking at the way we do immigration enforcement, and we're continually looking at the way that we implement our existing policies so that the president mentioned now that if you have a petition before the agency for the first time ever, you can find out the status of your petition online or through text messages. We've eliminated the backlog for FBI checks. Um, so we are, the administration is doing everything that we can to, within the bounds of the law to make sure that we're fulfilling our responsibilities and that we're enforcing the law in a way that's smart. Uh, but in the end, that's not going to be sufficient to deal with what really ails our immigration system. And so the president has already met with the Senate Republicans. He's met with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus. He's brought a bipartisan group to the White House to talk through how to get this done and how to work together to get it done. We're going to continue to do those things. Um, we're going to continue to create the space for Republicans to come forward um, and uh, because we need them in order to get this job done. Um, so one of the things we've learned is that you have to keep pushing issues. We've chosen priorities that are, that are challenging issues. Um, but we've chosen those because those are really the problems that vex this country that we need to be addressing. And so we're going to continue to push until we get this job done. All right. And uh, Brian, you got one more? Sure. Uh, we have one reader who wants to know if the administration would consider dropping the per country limit on green cards. You talked a little bit about the, the backlog before. Is that says it's, it's something that could greatly benefit people from China and India. Yeah, so um, this is a highly technical question. So the, the reason that the family immigration and business immigration system are backlogged is really twofold. There is a number for each category of immigrants. So there's a, a number of uh, spouses of legal permanent residents who can come every year and a number for adult sons and daughters who can come every year. So there's a numerical limitation for each category. And then there's a ceiling so that no country can send more than a certain number. And the reason for that is to make sure that no one or two countries completely swamp all of the visa categories so that if you're from Mexico, say, or China or India, without the per-country limitations, those countries might take all of the visas and there would be none available for somebody from any other part of the world. So this is, this is one of the challenging questions for Congress to consider is how to make sure that our visa categories and numerical limitations are set in such a way that we maximize the ability to keep families together, maximize our ability to bring in the people that we need for a robust economy. Okay, and uh, Maggie, you want to take one last crack at her? Sure. Um, to sort of follow up on, on that question, um, I got a, a question from a reader that was actually asking about, you know, I guess folks who are on visas or have green cards um, when they're in this country, if they marry someone who's still living abroad, that apparently that's very difficult to yes. get that spouse uh, to move to to the U.S. So, what are you? What are the plans for streamlining that? Or has the president given any thought to that aspect? Yeah. Again, he talked today in the speech about the long waiting period that keeps uh, husbands and wives even apart, which just it doesn't make any sense. And again. This is one of those things where if you're asked to be separate, to be separated from a loved one for a long period of time, you know, it may not be right, but some families make the choice to reunite anyway. Uh, and then those folks end up here illegally. And that's just a result of our backlogs. Um, so part of what we mean by a comprehensive immigration reform is taking a look at what doesn't make sense in our legal immigration system that really contradicts our best values. There's no reason to have multiple obstacles uh, in the way of American citizens uh, who want to bring in their husbands and wives. Or even the folks, I mean, I, what I'm asking is not just American citizens, but folks who are already on visas. Right. You know, they already have permission to be here, and yet it's very difficult for them to bring a spouse who maybe they met um, after they already had their, right. their visa here. So right. Again, they we, would fall in the same sort of category. And, and these are obstacles that we can't fix administratively. They're obstacles that are inherent in the law. 
And part of what we mean by reforming what's wrong with the legal immigration system is making sure that people here who are here on valid visas can reunite with their spouses and without having to wait. In some cases, for people on temporary visas, the wait can be years long, and that just doesn't make any sense. Okay, I'm going to close out with one, one more question from the chat, and this has been kind of a debate that's been going on throughout the entire uh, discussion here, and it's been the back and forth about uh, taxes, and mm -hmm. some people are arguing, well, you know, undocumented uh, immigrants are getting away with getting benefits, but they're not paying taxes. Some are saying, well, no, we are paying taxes, but we're not getting the benefits. And I, 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 don't, I don't necessarily want you to sell that debate so much as talk about what comprehensive immigration reform has to do with this debate. The, when the president describes this whole notion of accountability and holding immigrants accountable, one of the things he means is that uh, they need to by, be required to step forward and make sure, and we need to make sure that they become taxpayers. Some of them already are, but ultimately, it's inherent in having a population, uh, a large population of people who are here without their papers, uh, that we're missing opportunities to make sure everybody is completely included. And so it's very clear that one of the requirements uh, of an accountability infrastructure for the immigrants themselves is making sure that they come forward, that they learn English, that they, that they pay a fine, and that they pay taxes. So we can resolve that question once and for all by making sure that that's built in to the ways in which we hold immigrants accountable. All right. Um, well, I just want to thank everybody else uh, for coming yet again. I think this was really one of the most interesting discussions we've managed to have in one of these kind of forums, and uh, we'll definitely be in touch in the future. Cecilia, thanks so much. Always a pleasure, and uh, thanks everybody for watching and being part of the discussion.